Welcome back, everyone. We're diving into a pretty heavy topic today. It's um, well, it's medical apartheid. Oh wow! And and it's uh, it's a book that exposes this uh, really disturbing history of medical abuse, mm-hmm. uh, but specifically focusing on African Americans. Yeah, it's a it's a tough read at times, but it's so important to understand this history. It is, you know, to see how these past injustices Let's are still impacting healthcare today. Yeah, and and one of the things that really struck me uh, right from the beginning was how medical apartheid frames this whole issue of slavery. Right. It it goes beyond just the horrific conditions, you know, the 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 the, the forced labor, all of that. Mm-hmm. It really highlights how deeply ingrained the commodification of black bodies was in the entire system. Yeah. Like at a fundamental level. Absolutely. The book talks about how their worth was literally measured by their ability to work and and this is really disturbing, but also their ability to reproduce. Yeah, the the book talks about Thomas Jefferson, right? Oh, yeah. And and how he actually calculated the value of enslaved women yeah. based on their reproductive capacity. It's it's chilling when you think about it. Like frequent pregnancies were encouraged just to increase the slave population. And no regard for the women's health or well-being. It was all about profit. Just completely dehumanizing. And that dehumanization is so evident in the book's descriptions of the the slave ships. Oh gosh, yeah. You know, the rampant sexual exploitation by crew members. I mean, just just horrifying. It led to a widespread prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases. And it just shows this complete lack of concern for their health, their dignity, you know. Their bodies were seen as tools for profit not as human beings. And tragically, this disregard for black lives extended to medical practices too. Mm. Medical apartheid really exposes how enslaved people were often subjected to these right. really harsh and, and often completely ineffective treatments. It was it was common for them to be used in medical experimentation without anesthesia, well, without consent. Oh, what? The book talks about a physician, Dr. Thomas Hamilton. Okay. He actually used enslaved people in experiments to try and find a cure for sunstroke. So essentially using them as human guinea pigs. Exactly. And the book makes it clear that this wasn't an isolated incident. This was a pattern of medical neglect and abuse. And it was all rooted in this belief that black bodies were somehow different, Mm -hmm. less deserving of care. And that belief, you know, it fueled the emergence of what we now call scientific racism. This whole idea of using pseudoscience to justify slavery. Yeah, like twisting observations to fit a racist agenda. Right, right. Claiming that black people were a separate, inferior species. And that somehow justified their continued exploitation. It's it's mind-boggling. The book talks about Samuel Cartwright, right? Oh, yeah. This physician who came up with his diagnosis, drapetomania. This supposed mental illness that caused enslaved people to run away. Like they were sick for wanting freedom. It's it's a truly disturbing example of how medicine was used to control and dehumanize black people. Yeah, they used this, this so-called science to justify the most inhumane practices. And medical apartheid doesn't stop there. Right. It goes on to describe how this fascination with black bodies led to their display in freak shows and museums. It's just another layer of dehumanization. The story of Otabenga, this Congolese pygmy who was exhibited in a zoo. Alongside apes. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah, and and the exploitation of Sarchi Bartman. The hot and tot Venus. Her body was put on display in Europe. And then dissected after her death. It's just, it's horrifying. And then there's the story of Joyce Heth. Right. An elderly enslaved woman who was falsely promoted as George Washington's 161-year-old nurse. They actually held a public autopsy of her. It's like their bodies were seen as these these specimens. Not as human beings. And with the rise of hospitals in the 19th century, Mm. medical apartheid shows how this demand for clinical material led to even more exploitation. Hospitals needed living patients for medical students to practice on. To experiment on. And so, African Americans, especially those who were poor. Who didn't have access to private physicians. They became the primary subjects for these clinical displays. The book mentions Casper Yagen, whose body ended up in the anatomy lab at Howard University. After his death. And his family wasn't even notified. This kind of exploitation really fueled a deep fear and distrust of hospitals within the black community. And then on top of that, there was this horrifying practice of body snatching. Yes. The book describes how bodies of deceased African Americans were stolen from graves and sold to medical schools for dissection. Oh my gosh. So they were robbing graves to get their hands on black bodies. Essentially. And laws like the Bone Bill, 
and the Gasly Act actually gave anatomists legal access to the bodies of the poor who were disproportionately black. It's just unbelievable. It was legalized exploitation. The book even describes the discovery of barrels filled with body parts of African Americans being shipped to medical schools. It's just, it's just horrifying. This complete disregard for their humanity. And it seems like this willingness to experiment on black bodies with this this casual disregard for their well-being just permeates this entire period. And as we'll see, it doesn't end with the 19th century. It continues in different forms. The legacy of medical abuse is a long and tragic one. And it's something that we need to confront head on if we want to create a more just and equitable healthcare system. Absolutely. Understanding this history is crucial to understanding the disparities that persist today. It's a heavy but incredibly important conversation. And medical apartheid really forces us to reckon with this dark chapter in American history. And that's a chapter that's not often talked about. But it's essential to understand if we want to move forward. We need to acknowledge these past injustices in order to create a better future. A future where healthcare is truly equitable and accessible for all. That's the goal. And medical apartheid gives us a framework for understanding how we got here and what we need to do to move forward. And and this exploitation, it uh, it didn't just vanish, it, it morphed. Right. And sometimes these, these new forms were, were even more, more insidious because they were disguised as progress, you know, as, as science. Yeah, medical apartheid connects those historical abuses to modern examples. Yeah. And and one that that I found really disturbing was the Kennedy Krieger Institute lead paint study. Oh, yeah, in Baltimore. Yeah, back in the 90s. That one sparked a lot of controversy. They were basically recruiting black families right. who who lived in housing with with known lead paint hazards. And they were testing cheaper lead abatement methods, right? Exactly. Instead of fully removing the lead paint so so they were exposing these families to lead. Well, the researchers claimed they had parental consent. Okay. And they argued that if these these cheaper methods worked, it would benefit the community. But but lead is incredibly harmful, especially to kids. Yeah. Critics argued that those families were basically coerced into participating. Right. You know, they were desperate for better housing. So it was it was a really tough situation. Yeah, and and it raises these ethical questions about consent, especially when you're talking about research that puts kids at risk. Absolutely. And it highlights how systemic neglect can make certain communities more vulnerable. And and it's like that same pattern we've been talking about just keeps repeating itself. Yeah, this willingness to experiment on black bodies. With a disregard for their well-being. It's, it's really disturbing. The book also goes into this really unsettling chapter uh, about psychiatric experimentation on black prisoners. Yeah, in the 50s. Oh, wow. There was this the psychiatrist at Tulane University, Dr. Robert Heath. Okay. And he was implanting electrodes into the brains of black prisoners. Electrodes in their brains. What was he doing? He was trying to stimulate what he called the pleasure centers of the brain. Like like trying to control their emotions. He was researching the biological basis of pleasure and addiction. And and did he get consent from these prisoners? Well, that's, a, that's the issue, you know. The book questions the ethics of those experiments, right. whether they could truly give informed consent. And it gets even more unsettling because medical apartheid mentions that he was also doing these CIA-funded experiments with LSD. And another drug, Bulbocap-9. I have never even heard of that. It can induce a catatonic state. Oh, wow. And and the CIA was interested in in mind control. So so they were using black prisoners for these experiments. Yes, and it raises those same ethical concerns about vulnerability and consent. It's it's just horrifying to think of it. And it connects to this larger issue of mass incarceration. The overrepresentation of black men in prisons. Medical apartheid argues that this has historically made them targets for medical exploitation. So so it's not just a thing of the past. No. It's still happening today. It's it's heartbreaking, but it's also a reminder of how deeply embedded this this systemic racism is. It's even in our medical institutions. It's like the, the dehumanization we see in the past is is still echoing in these modern examples. And the book also delves into the legacy of eugenics. Eugenics. That's that's a tough topic. But yeah. uh, could you could you maybe explain it a little bit? It was a movement focused on improving the human race Go ahead. through selective breeding. They used practices like forced sterilization. And they often targeted marginalized communities, right? Yes, including black women. And medical apartheid argues that this this legacy of reproductive control is still happening in more subtle ways today. Like how? 
Well, it points to the disproportionate use of long-term contraceptives. On black women. Especially those in the criminal justice system. So so it's like that question of autonomy comes up again. Yeah. Right? Who gets to make decisions about their own bodies. Exactly. And the book connects those concerns to the history of forced sterilization. It's like a direct line from the past to the prevalent. It's impacting black women's reproductive rights even today. There's this thread running through all of it. Yes. From the slave ships to the lead paint study to the prison experiments. This is about control. And this disregard for black lives. You're getting at the core of what medical apartheid is trying to show us. Yeah. It's not just isolated events. It's, it's a system of exploitation. A pattern of abuse. And as we move into genetics and medical research. Those patterns keep showing up. Often in more subtle ways. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm. The book talks about genetics and race and medical research, mm. and it, it highlights the potential benefits, but also the dangers. One of the most fascinating cases is Bedil. Oh, the heart medication. That was marketed specifically to African Americans. Yeah, that caused a lot of debate back then. About race-based medicine. I remember thinking, isn't race a social construct, not a biological one? Right. How can you have medicine just for one race? And that's exactly the debate that Bedil started. The book delves into these questions, yeah. you know, warning about reducing complex health issues to simple genetics. Right, because you have to consider the social and environmental factors, too. Exactly. If we only focus on genetics, we risk overlooking those factors. And we could end up perpetuating stereotypes. And those stereotypes have real consequences. They can lead to misdiagnosis. Inappropriate treatments. And they reinforce this idea that black people are somehow different. Or deficient. So medical apartheid is urging us to be really careful about how we use genetic information. Especially when it's tied to race. The book also discusses the ethics of genetic testing. For diseases like sickle cell anemia, right, which disproportionately affect black populations. And, and that can lead to stigmatization and discrimination. It's like this history of medical abuse is a warning. About how we approach genetic research. We have to be so mindful of the potential harm. Even as we explore the potential benefits. And it's not just an American issue. Medical apartheid talks about how Western researchers have done unethical trials in developing countries. So, so it's global. Absolutely. It talks about HIV AIDS research in Africa. Where black participants were denied access to treatments or enrolled without proper consent. It's a reminder that scientific knowledge can't come at the cost of human rights. We can't repeat those mistakes. And the book ties this global exploitation back to racial bias. It's all connected. It's fueled by those same racist assumptions about black bodies. It's, it's a lot to take in. It is. But medical apartheid does such a good job of connecting everything. It's all part of this larger system of exploitation and medical abuse. That's been targeting black people for centuries. It's overwhelming, but it's also a call to action. So, so what are the key takeaways? What can we do to address these inequities? It's a, uh, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. The book actually offers some hope. Yeah. It, it talks about the need for transparency and accountability in medical research. Right. Like really engaging with the community, making sure people understand what's going on. So it's about building trust. Right. Exactly. And, and recognizing that a lot of black patients might be hesitant to seek care. Yeah, given the history. Because of that history, medical apartheid calls for culturally sensitive approaches to health care. Yeah, recognizing that trauma not, and yeah. working to rebuild that trust. And it's not just about offering the same services to everyone. Yeah. It's about acknowledging the unique experiences of different communities. Especially those who've been marginalized. And and one way to do that is by diversifying the healthcare workforce. Yeah, we need more black physicians and nurses and researchers. That representation is so important. Not just for providing culturally competent care, but but also for challenging those systemic biases. Yeah, we need diverse perspectives. So to, to, to shake things. To that, advocate for more equitable policies. And medical apartheid also calls for stronger regulations, for, right? For medical research to prevent these abuses from happening again. So like informed consent, making sure people really understand the risks. Especially when you're dealing with vulnerable populations. We need those safeguards. To protect people. To make sure everyone is treated with dignity. It's it's about recognizing that medical research can be this amazing tool for healing. Right. But it can also be really dangerous if it's not handled responsibly. So, so what does this all mean for us as individuals? Well, I think the first step is awareness. Educating ourselves. Yeah, learning about this history, understanding why there's so much medical mistrust in black communities. 
and seeing how those inequities are still present today. Medical Apartheid is a great place to start. It's such a powerful book. And once we have that knowledge, we can start taking action. Like how? Well, we can support organizations working to diversify healthcare. Right. We can advocate for stronger patient protections, mm -hmm. and we can address those social and economic factors that contribute to health disparities. So it's about pushing for systemic change. Yeah, and being mindful of our own biases. Even small actions can make a difference. It's a call to be more conscious, more compassionate. And more committed to creating a healthcare system that truly serves everyone. It's a journey, but medical apartheid gives us a really good guide. It's been a heavy conversation. It has. But so important. If this has resonated with you. I hope it has. We encourage you to learn more. You can actually purchase Medical Apartheid using the link in our episode description. It's a book that will really make you think. And we all have a role to play in dismantling this legacy of Medical Apartheid. Yeah, we can create a healthcare system that's truly just and equitable. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive.